the music and the children's sermon and the liturgist, and I enjoy the music in this service as well. Very gifted. When I saw that this passage from Ephesians was in the lectionary for today, I got very excited. I love this passage from Ephesians, and probably at least a large part of why I love this passage from Ephesians is that I know that in the original Greek, it was one long run-on sentence. No punctuation, no pauses. It's like the author of Ephesians couldn't wait to get it all out. It reminds me a little bit, I'm going to pick on my youngest daughter. It reminds me a little bit of my youngest daughter when she has a really juicy, exciting story to tell you. You can tell it's going to be really juicy and exciting because she takes a deep breath, and then she tells you all in one breath, and her words are just falling on top of each other, and you have to listen really quick because it's just so exciting. That's right, isn't it? (laughs) And I picture the author of Ephesians that way. This is such an amazing message that our author just can't wait to get all the words out. And yes, if I have to be really honest with you, I am prone to that kind of speech too if I get excited about something. So I will try not to preach that way today. If your brain needs a break, I'm going too fast, just hold up your hand and say, breathe. But it's no wonder that our author of Ephesians is so excited because our author starts at the beginning, at the beginning that we often forget is the beginning. God, all of these amazing plans, all of this amazing good news about who we are starts with God. In Ephesians chapter 1, 3, and 4, we hear that, what verse 4 tells us that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. So God's plans, God's purpose, come first. They're bigger than us, but they include us in Christ. Now, I think that that's a really good place to start because sometimes we get confused about our place in God's plans. Sometimes we think that God's plans, God's grace can't possibly include us because, well, we have sins that are that are too horrible to mention you know all those skeletons in our closet that only god knows about and sometimes on the opposite end of the spectrum we think that god's plan god's grace only includes us that it's only about us however we define that us Have you noticed that in our current climate, we live in such a divisive time, don't we? There's so much us versus them, however we want to define the us. Whether we want to call it Protestant or Catholic, mainline conservative, evangelical, Democrat, Republican, whatever categories we use, we want to define us and them. We all do it, and it hurts us all. And our author of Ephesians looks at these humanly made categories and, and shouts, no, all in one breath. <laughs> 
No. God's plans and God's purpose come before us. They include us, but they're bigger than any of us. All of the, uh, all of the verbs and the pronouns in the original Greek in this passage are plural. So we're talking about a big we, us. So once we've got that, that right order to things, we know that God's plans, God's purpose are bigger than us. They come before us, but they include us. The author goes on to just, oh my goodness, share so much good news. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. That's verse 7. Verses 8 and 9, with all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will. Verse 11, in Christ we have also obtained an inheritance. And in verse 13, you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, and were marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit. This is good news, because this is telling us who we are. We're not just moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas, single people, widowed people, teachers, engineers, rich, poor, whatever. This is the core of who we are. We are chosen. We are God's. First John chapter 3 verse 1 says, See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are, sealed by the Holy Spirit. Verse 14 tells us that that seal is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. That phrase, to the praise of his glory, actually shows up three times in our passage. Back in verse 6, he destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ according to the pleasure of his good will, to the praise of his glorious grace. It's in verse 12. So that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. And it's in verse 14. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. Now, my New Testament professor in seminary used to say to us, if something is repeated, it must be important. Three times this is repeated. So it must be important. What does that phrase mean to the praise of his glory? I think first, again, it reminds us that all of this good news, it's not about us. It's about God. It's about God at work in us. And that's good news because it means that I, I don't have to be able to muster up and do a good job for God because it doesn't depend on me. That's really good news. It means that we're called to live to the praise of his glory through the highs and the lows of life. And it means that when we, when we love others with God's love, when we let that love flow through us, God is glorified. Years ago, when I was a new and much younger youth pastor at a little Nazarene church, 
I found out that my beloved grandfather had been diagnosed with terminal lung cancer, and it was devastating to me. That Sunday evening in church, I stayed after the service, and, and I went forward to our little altar rail, and I, I knelt there, and I just cried. I didn't have any, any words to pray to God. My, my tears were all I had. And as I knelt there, the most incredible thing happened. I started to sense movement around me. I started to feel hands on my shoulders and on my back. I started to hear whispered words, whispered prayers for comfort. I started to hear others shedding tears on my behalf. The people of that tiny little church had surrounded me at the altar, and they, they knelt there with me, and they prayed there with me, and they cried there with me. They loved me that night to the praise of God's glory. And God was glorified that night in that little church. I bet you have had similar experiences in your life where, where others have loved you to the praise of God's glory. Can you, can you see those people in your mind's eye? Can you remember what it was like? Give thanks. Thank God for those moments when others love us so well. So, what does all of this mean for us today? Or to ask it a different way, the way that we're living day to day, do our lives, are we living to the praise of God's glory? Here's another moment of honesty. My, my resounding answer to the question of whether I'm living to the praise of God's glory is sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I'm living to the praise of God's glory. And then sometimes I'm too busy or I'm too cranky or I have other priorities. Sometimes, worst of all, I think that living to the praise of God's glory depends on me, that I need to buckle down and do a better job. But the good news of this passage, it doesn't depend on us to buckle down and do a better job. God's plans and God's purposes are so much bigger than us. Those people in that little Nazarene church who loved me so well, they didn't love me so well because they resolved to do a better job. They loved me because they were so in love with God. They spent time with God, they prayed, they studied scripture, they sang, they, they were overflowing with the love of God, and so they couldn't help but love me that night. So if we're struggling to live to the praise of God's glory, it doesn't mean we have to do a better job. It means we need to plug in to our source. It means we need more Jesus in our hearts. We need more prayer, more time alone with God, more time together with God. God's plans and God's purposes are bigger than us, but they include us. And when we plug into the source, 
that love can't help but flow through us to the praise of God's glory. May you know this week that you are so loved, and may that love flow through you to bless others to the praise of God's glory. Amen and amen. Let's stand and join in our closing song today. Beautiful one, beautiful one.